Wow, what a ride. I'm sad it's over, but I'm happy to have been here. After last week's depressing ending, not much in episode 10 of Shogun, A Dream of a Dream, helps to raise my spirits. But still, it was a fantastic episode. You know a show is great when you can't stop thinking about it, and Shogun has made me feel emotions like no show has done before. A quick point of order regarding last week's episode. Blackthorn drawing a line in the sand is a callback to the captain of the Erasmus telling him that every man has to draw a line. Just before installing a sunroof in his own head. Kino! This episode features one of the biggest exposition scenes in living memory. Basically the whole plot is laid out for those who missed it. It seems a little out of place considering the callback made at the time, but I guess that's a concession they had to make to modern audiences. The final episode can also be a little disappointing as it refocuses the entire series onto what the actual point was all along. All of the romance, adventure, laughs, all of it was just set up for the battle for the rule of the Japans. If you think we're going to tie all of the plot lines up in a bow, you're sorely mistaken. What matters here is the battle for control and the rest is just a distraction. For the finale of Shogun, I'm giving it a 9 out of 10. It was a fantastic episode that just folded in a few places. The exposition dump being my main issue. I would also like to have seen a few more loose ends tied up, but who knows, maybe they're saving it for season 2. They could be awaiting until after awards season to announce it so they can claim their limited series Emmys. An epilogue would also have been nice. As for the season as a whole, while it does have some minor issues, the entire production was incredible. The casting, the sets, the costumes, the music, the locations and acting, the dialogue, all top shelf stuff. It's a must watch series and I'm unreservedly giving it a 10 out of 10. One of my favourite TV shows of all time. Up there with Band of Brothers. I just wish there was more. I don't want it to end. I was sucked into the world of Shogun like no show since Game of Thrones, but Shogun stuck the landing. I might do another video comparing the 1980s version to the 2024 version, as there were some pretty interesting deviations between the two shows. I watched three of the four episodes of the 1980s version after watching episode 9 left me feeling miserable. It didn't do much to help. <laughs> I'm not usually the kind of person who follows producers or showrunners, but I might have to keep an eye on Rachel Kondo and Justin Marks. Also, Hiroyuki Sonata. What are we watching next, lads? My calendar's empty until Star Wars Acolyte and House of the Dragon Season 2. Put your recommendations in the comments, and thanks for hanging out with me during this amazing series. Anyway, let's get into the recap and the spoilers. The episode opens with two kids in a bedroom of a western house decorated with eastern artifacts. They're discussing the katana on display, and they turn to the old man in the bed and ask if it was really given to him by a savage. He's shown clutching Mariko's rosary beads as he looks off into the distance. I hate to say, but the old man makeup here is pretty cheesy. But maybe that's explained by the fact that it's just a coma-induced hallucination as Blackthorn is brought back to consciousness by Yabushigi shaking him. Blackthorn goes to Mariko's lifeless body and prays a little prayer for Mariko's soul as Yabushigi asks for forgiveness. Toronaga has left Ido and is now preparing for war. The Christian regents are disgusted that such an attack could take place in Osaka. Toronaga's brother Seiki presents a letter of protest for the death of Mariko to Ishido. Is Seiki back on Toronaga's side? Ishido claims that only Toronaga could have orchestrated such an attack, and now I'm starting to agree. Crimson Sky might have been setting Yabushigi up to let the ninjas in himself. Seems unlikely, but still possible. He always seems to have plans within plans. Ishido wants to go to war now. The Christians want a proper Christian burial, which Ishido refuses, but Lady Achiba declares that she will be giving a generous cuckoo, um, funeral. As soon as they declare war on Toronaga, an earthquake hits and shakes their conviction. Ishido then goes to visit Yabushigi. Poor old Yabs, he's shell-shocked. Here I think it's solidified that Toronaga didn't order the ninja attack and it was Ishido's plan. Ishido tells Yabushigi that after Toronaga is gone, his seat on the council is assured. How is that possible, as there are already five regents? Maybe Ishido is just telling Yabushigi nice things? 
Yabushigi recalls how the Taiko was going to attack Torunaga, but then an earthquake happened that his allies said was a bad omen, so they called off the attack and settled for peace. Yabushigi is clearly out of his mind as he keeps trying to catch an imaginary catfish. Ishido tells him to return to Izu and gather his army, but I think even he realizes that Yabushigi is a lost cause. Ishido is down one army already. Torunaga is shown releasing his falcon. I took this to mean he's now released Mariko from her duty and she is free. The bit about bearing many daughters, I take that to mean the repercussions of her life will flow onward throughout history. Torunaga closes his eyes, we get another scene of the old man in his bed being asked if the sword was given to him by a savage, and then Blackthorn awakens from having slept through Mariko's funeral. Probably for the best, as I would have cried too much and been unable to watch the rest of the episode. Blackthorn is being permitted to leave Osaka and return to Torunaga with an escort from Kiyama. Father Martin is there also as his guide. We get another beautiful scene as Blackthorn is being led through the forest and stops to talk to Father Martin. He talks about how he attempted to give Marika her last rites, not before the Catholic God or the Protestant God, but just before God. Martin assures Blackthorn that Marika was already sanctified and that she would have liked to have seen them being civil to each other. Blackthorn asks if this is where he gets killed and Martin admits that that was the plan but another arrangement has been made. He will be led safely out of Osaka. On the docks, Martin explains that it was Mariko's doing that he made it out alive. She begged that he be saved by the church, and he has now kept his word. Blackthorn struggles to suppress a tear as he is ferried to Torunaga's galley, and I assume that is what I looked like throughout this scene. Even re-watching it for my review has got me choked up. Lady Achiba is writing a poem and the heir asks what on a leafless branch means. She explains that it was written by a friend and the heir asks if it was the one who was recently buried. She explains that is why they must finish the poem. He suggests that a branch can also have flowers or fruit which reminds Lady Achiba of the last thing Mariko said to her. Accepting death isn't surrender. Flowers are only flowers because they fall. Back to Torunaga's galley and Yabushi is trying desperately to align his fate with Anjin. Let's get on your ship. Take me back to your country. Teach me how to dive like you did with Torunaga. It's sad, really. But then they spot the burnout hulk of the Erasmus in the bay. On the shore, Omi is there to arrest Yabushi in the name of Torunaga. Torunaga has his army in Izu now. Miraji explains to Blackthorn how the Erasmus was burnt. He thinks it was by Christians in the village. Blackthorn realized this was organized by Mariko in exchange for his life. Lady Mariko arranged during her confession that the church ensure the safe return of Blackthorn to Ajiro. In return, she offered the destruction of the Erasmus. Without a ship, the church will not have to worry about Blackthorn harassing the black ship for a year or two until he has built a new ship. The Christian regents are also bound by whatever decision the church makes. Torunaga is going through the village to find those who aided the Christians. The entire town is being harassed by his men until they find the culprits. And by harassed, I mean brutalized. Yabushigi is brought before Torunaga and presented with the evidence that he let the assassins into the castle. Yabushigi admits to it. I guess that's the guilt he's feeling getting the better of him. All of his lands are forfeit and he must slit his belly by sundown. In classic Yabushigi style, he asks for a better death, like being torn apart by cannons or eaten by angry fish. Yabushigi asks Omi be given his lands, but it's already gone. No longer his to give. Is that a callback to the cannon regiment in episode 5 when it was given to Omi who tried to give it back to Yabushigi? He got mad because he already knew it was his. Yabushigi asks for the Anjin to be his second in Sudoku, but Torunaga refuses, so he chooses Torunaga himself. Lucky, otherwise the exposition dump couldn't happen. A nice little scene with Blackthorn and my girl Fujisama. They seem happy in each other's company. Is this the first time we've seen them alone? At least since Blackthorn learned a little Japanese. 
I know a little Japanese. Her name is Fujisawa. I'd hoped that we could have seen them hold hands or something, but this will have to suffice for now. Toronaga received a secret letter from Lady Achiba. Toronaga then goes on to recite Mariko's poem from episode 8, just before she agrees to go to Osaka for Crimson Sky. Great acting by Sonata here. He really sells the choking back tears. I should know. A sad scene of Fuji explaining that she is going to inter her husband and son at the family temple and claims that she is going to become a nun to remain alongside them. Blackthorn denies her, but she says he doesn't have the right as she is no longer his consort. Did she say yes when Blackthorn said Fujisama nun? Is Fuji learning some English? Or is that just a coincidence that the Japanese word for yes in this situation sounds like yes? Isn't the word for yes, hi? Anyway, Blackthorn agrees Fuji is best girl, um, best nun. Fuji explains that she is sad because the village is suffering due to Toronaga attempting to find the saboteurs. Blackthorn is sad too and asks that she set up a meeting with Toronaga. The next morning, Blackthorn contemplates life in his rock garden. I like to think he's remembering his fondness for Yujiro and thinking back to how his words and actions can have big impact upon this small village. Omi comes to collect Blackthorn for the meeting and he has to ask for Anjin's weapons. Seeing Fuji there must have got him thinking, not again. But Blackthorn hands them over and sweetly bows to Fuji. They're so cute. Toranaga asks that Miraji end his deception and reveal that he's actually a samurai who became a Christian in order to spy on his enemies. He informs Blackthorn that Toranaga will not rest until they find who burned his ship. Blackthorn asks that Toranaga leave Ajiro alone as they did not burn his ship. It was Mariko, as discussed earlier. Toranaga refuses as the people who helped burn the ship are still in the village and are still disloyal. Blackthorn offers his life in exchange for the village, as it was he who was disloyal, but Toranaga doesn't want to hear it. Blackthorn points at himself and shouts, Teki, which means enemy. This coincides with an earth tremor and another vision of the future. I see this as Blackthorn deciding that this is where that version of the future ends. He won't die old in his bed with his family close. He's going to die the way of the Japanese, Sudoku. Another callback to Mariko saying, we live and we die. Blackthorn attempts to commit Sudoku, but Toronaga stops him physically from going ahead with it. Toronaga tells him to build him some ships. Brutal. But he does give him a nice pat on the shoulder, something I doubt Bantaro would get. A nice little scene between Yabushi and Omi, telling him that he trusts him with the family name and considers him the son he never had. I like how his death poem says to feed his body to the dogs. At last, now he will get as close as possible to death. And of course, we can't have a Yabushigi scene without another delicious will. And here it is. The scene that boils down the last eight weeks of viewing into one digestible morsel. Toronaga explains that Mariko bargained for the ship to be burned and Toronaga agreed in order to spare Blackthorn. And he'll do it again if he has to. When asked about the regents being allied against him with the heir's army and needing to enact Crimson Sky again, Toronaga explains that Crimson Sky has already been completed. Mariko did everything he needed to get an army out in the open away from the impenetrable Osaka castle walls. This is another callback to episode 4 where he praises the killing of Josen as a way to get the enemy outside of the castle walls. Mariko's death causes Achiba to switch allegiance. The Christian regents are forced into a position where they cannot abide their own hostage situation, compounded by the murder of a fellow Christian, also influenced by the church, and finally seeing that Ishido no longer fights with the blessing of the air, they are not going to back Ishido. Toronaga is free to begin his rule from Edo, the city that is now modern day Tokyo. Toronaga wanted to become Shogun all along. It was his third heart, the one he does not show to anyone else. Toronaga did not care about the cannons, nor Blackthorn's tactics. He saw them as a source of amusement as well as a distraction for his enemies. They bickered over whether he should be put to death, which caused them to lose focus on what was the most important thing, killing Toronaga. Callbacks galore. 
Calling back to episode two, the episode that made me fall in love with Shogun. Blackthorn is told by Toronaga he is outnumbered and it is pointless. To which Blackthorn responds, unless I win. There's a callback to episode one with Yabashigi telling Omi that you don't tell a dead man the future. Yabushigi takes a moment to enjoy the view and then, like tearing off a band-aid, he sticks his knife into his own belly, gives Toronaga the look of a madman and it's all over for the best TV character of the past decade. Farewell, Lord Yabushi, you shall be missed. And Toronabu Asano will be certain to collect his Emmy on the way out. Brilliant performance and a name I will follow from now on. A very touching final scene between Fujisama and Blackthorn. He takes her and her family's ashes and they spread them in the ocean so that they'll be together forever. I appreciate that Fuji gives a little smile when she tips her poor baby's ashes into the sea. At least now, I feel like she agreed fully. Then Blackthorn takes out Mariko's rosary and offers to share the honours with Fuji. But she says it should be his hands that are the last to hold her. Another callback to episode 1 where Fuji-sama had to hand over her son to be killed. I'm not crying, you're crying. I'm hoping that they lived happily ever after. Blackthorn has half the village out pulling the wreck of the Erasmus out of the bay. There's yet another callback. Blackthorn says it's like pissing in the wind, which is a callback to episode 7 when Yabushigi is trying to talk to Blackthorn about how to get out of Toronaga surrendering. Yabushigi says that Blackthorn can't even understand him and it's like pissing in the wind. Miraji is there interpreting and Buntaro comes along and lends a hand. Now that the woman is out of the picture, these two can finally be bros. They even share a cold one together. Toronaga is viewing this from the nearby spur and gives a subtle knowing nod to Blackthorn who returns the favour. Toronaga turns and views the approaching storm clouds and thus ends the greatest TV show I have seen in 20 odd years. I loved episode 10 of Shogun A Dream of a Dream, and it's getting a 9 out of 10. So why not a 10 out of 10? I tell you it was damn close, but there's just this nagging in the back of my mind, and I have to have some standards. The unnecessary flash forwards, it felt too real, and wasn't really represented well as a dream during Blackthorn's coma. I feel he would have put his grandkids over his knee if they disrespected the noble people of the Japans like that. Especially his beloved Mariko. How do we know they're fake? He has Mariko's rosary, which he threw into the ocean with Fuji's family ashes. The lack of Mariko's funeral? I don't think I could have handled it, so I'm neither removing nor adding points for its absence. Exposition dump ending. I guess they wanted to end on Toronaga and Yabashiki discussing what they did and why, but it felt a little rushed. I would have liked to have seen more of the look on Ashido's face when the heir's army does not materialise. An epilogue would also have been nice, with just a few minutes, even in voiceover, to wrap up a few things. Maybe a bit about whether Blackthorn and Fuji stayed together. Does Omi get back with Kiku or is she staying in Edo? Ashido's fate. Does he get buried? What does Toronaga do with Ashido in the air? What is the fate of the remaining regents? How does the black ship fare once Blackthorn gets his ship built? I could look up the actual history of the time period and William Adams' life, but it's not the same thing. The sadness. Maybe this is a product of being raised on Saccharine and Sweet and they lived happily ever after style love stories, but boy oh boy, talk about a downer. I've had intrusive thoughts of sadness this past week. I don't think I'm supposed to feel this way about fictional characters, but I do. I kind of wish they'd lived happily ever after. But you know what they say, presence is most keenly felt in absence. If I got what I wanted, I wouldn't care as much as I do. The Sadness version 2.0, again with the absence. This time the absence of Shogun. Shogun has become a part of my routine these past nine weeks. It was only brought to my attention in January 2024 that a show called Shogun was being released. I had a gap in my schedule so I thought, why not, and added it to my calendar. I didn't even watch a trailer for it, I just saw the poster and the synopsis and thought it was a cool idea for a show. I'd not heard of the book, nor the 1980s version. 
episode one was good and I enjoyed watching it, but episode two got me hooked. The revelation to Torinaga about Spain and Portugal dividing the world between them piqued my imagination. From that moment forward, Tuesday was Shogun Day. I booked the next nine Wednesdays for annual leave so I could stay up and watch every episode twice. I told everyone who would listen about what an amazing show it was. I told people when this full series was due to be out so they could binge it if that was more to their liking. I gave them cheat sheets with the faces of the main characters on how to pronounce their names. And now, it's over. It's like there's a hole in my life that used to be filled with Shogun. I'm sure there's something else that will fill the hole, but for now it's there and it's currently filled with sadness. I'm going to try to watch the other James Clavell shows slash movies, King Rat, Noble House, Taipan. I doubt they will capture my imagination as much as Shogun, but I'll at least give them a chance. Regarding the chances of a season 2, the producers have said in interviews that this is it. They have recreated the book to the final page. However, associate producer and daughter of James Clavell, Michaela, has said that they did such a great job bringing the world of feudal Japan to life that there's no reason they couldn't continue the story. Do I want more Shogun? Yes and no. It's simple, really. Make more Shogun and make it as good as this series and I will be happy. Just don't bother if you're not going to do it justice. Book bros are probably going to complain that it was done better in the book or this series is missing important scenes. Same with 1980s fans. But I'm reviewing this purely as someone who'd never heard of Shogun before, and for me it was a complete story that was well told. As for the season as a whole, well, I'll tell you what you already know. It's a 10 out of 10. This show will stick with me for many years and will be at the top of my recommendation and best of lists. A masterpiece. But for a further analysis of the season as a whole and comparison to the 1980s versions, you'll have to wait for another video. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, please consider subscribing. I release reviews occasionally when time allows and a thumbs up would be a big motivator for further reviews. If you didn't like it, feel free to leave a thumbs down and let me know how I can improve in the comments below. Anyway, I'm Mixie. Thanks for your time and have a good one.